Hello everybody um, and thank you Gerard for that introduction. Um, as Gerard said, my name is Daisy and I'm joined with Helen today. Hi there. And also good afternoon to our participants uh, from our agencies in the Philippines, namely the Commission on Higher Education. We also have the University of Southeastern Philippines, the F Professional Regulations Commission, the Cooperative Development Authority, we also have participants from the Design Center of the Philippines, the Laguna Lake Development Authority, the Zamboanga City Special Economic Zone Authority, the Department of Information and Communications Technology, Department of Agrarian Reform, the Department of Interior and Local Government, and also the Metropolitan Development Authority. So good afternoon, Mike. Good afternoon, Helen. Good afternoon, Daisy. So I think it's good morning there in the UK. So as the Center of Excellence on Public Sector Productivity, we believe that we play a vital role in nation building by helping accelerate the transformation of people and organizations as an effort to stay relevant. This webinar series will serve as an avenue for promoting the latest topics of interest that may contribute to policy and program formulation. So this episode is entitled Knowledge Sharing How to Boost Innovation and Productivity in the Public Sector. So our first speaker is a Campaigns and Communications Associate with Apolitical. Previously, she was a project manager at McAllister Olivarius, an international law firm dedicated to defending women's rights. She has a Master's of Philosophy in Gender Studies from the University of Cambridge and a Bachelor of Arts in Global Affairs and Gender Studies from Yale University. Let's all welcome Ms. Helen Caldwell. Good morning there, Helen. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So our second speaker is also a Campaigns and Communications Associate at Apolitical. Previously, she was a content creator from an e-learning program for the Dutch Intelligence Services. She has a Master of Arts in International Relations from Utrecht University and a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of Warwick. Let us all welcome Daisy Ireton. Good afternoon, Daisy. Good morning there, Daisy. Hi, everyone. So welcome, and uh, we now turn it over to our two speakers, and we hope that uh, you learn a lot from this session. So as Gerard said, we're here today to talk to you about knowledge sharing, innovation and productivity in the public sector. But before we get into that, um, we want to give you a bit of a background of Apolitical and the organisation we work for um, to hopefully give a bit of context. So Apolitical is a global peer-to-peer -peer learning platform for government. Um, our slide says we have nearly 100,000 members, but actually this week we reached 100,000, um, which is a great milestone for us. Um, for a bit of context, when Helen and I joined the company a year ago, we had around 35,000. So we've seen a really rapid growth in how many members we've got. Um, and it's a very diverse um, network. We've got over 170 different countries represented, including over 300 public servants um, in the Philippines. And we hope that after today, there's going to be more of you guys on the platform. So what do we do? We provide free online learning and content to public servants and policymakers across the globe. And we have new workshops, a bit like this one, um, as well as email boot camps offered every week. We cover a very broad range of topics, so from public speaking to human centred design and also how to succeed at interviews. So as well as providing this, uh, this learning, this training, we also provide a platform for public servants to share their experiences and lessons learned by writing pieces of content. Now, more than 70% of the articles written on our platform are written by public servants just like you. Um, and you can learn how to contribute to these. Um, and it explains a bit how you can become a contributor to Apolitical. Um, when you do this, you work alongside an editor who supports you and kind of makes the piece the best it can be. We've also recently launched Apolitical Plus, which is our first paid experience, um, which gives public servants unlimited access to over 150 hours of bite-sized online learning, which is designed for 21st century government. Um, so as I said, we're going to talk to you about knowledge sharing, productivity and innovation in the public sector today. Um, we're going to be sharing the uh, lessons and tips that we've learned through our own work, working with public servants and teaching them new skills and also helping them to learn from each other. 
Um, so we're going to cover knowledge sharing first, then innovation and then productivity. Um, so it's going to be quite a rapid kind of uh, run through of these three sections. So bear with us as we try and get through the, uh, the content. Um, the main focus of this is to give you kind of tangible tips and ways that you can start knowledge sharing in the public sector. So we hope that we do that today. We also want to show you that knowledge sharing is actually a key part of successful innovation and innovation in turn can lead to increased public sector productivity and efficiency. Um, we want to hear as much as possible from you guys today. We don't want it just to be our voices. Um, so I can see a lot of you have already started introducing yourselves in the chat, which is really great. Um, if you want to let us know what's one thing you'd like to learn today. So if you want to share that in the chat, that would be appreciated. And we can see kind of what we're all here today for. As outlined, um, as I just said, one of Apolitical's key missions is to connect public servants to help them to learn from each other so that they can do their jobs better. In other words, we want to foster knowledge sharing amongst governments across the globe. And through our work, we have seen how much appetite there can be for learning in the public sector, particularly when it comes from learning from each other. Um, we've also seen a demand in the rise for learning in recent months with COVID-19, particularly in the online space as people take their work digital and want to seek out a connection with others um, in the space. So we did a survey back in the summer of over a thousand public servants from around the world, and we found that nearly nine tenths of people spent at least an hour a week learning with 64% learning at least every week with resources that were outside of their work or government organisation. And in fact, nearly half of those people also paid for online learning themselves. And so I'm just going to look into the chat now and see. OK, so lots of people wanting to know more about innovation, perhaps best practices on how to boost productivity. I think that we're going to cover that. How to get involved with aid political, that's certainly going to come up um, now and also later. Um, thanks for keeping those coming. Coping when transition to working online. I think there's some things we can say about that also. Through our work um, putting learning resources together for government, we found that people tend to respond best to practical ways of learning. So this looks like how to, ways to, lessons learn, even lessons from failure. Um, we've also learned that flexibility is a key um, part of learning for public servants because we know how time poor they can be. Um, so we really focus on making things bite sized um, and stuff that you can do alongside your, your job. Um, and I think that's reflected in the presentation as well, covering three different topics um, in 45 minutes. Um, it will certainly have a bite sized feel to it. Um, so now I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Helen, who's going to get us started um, on knowledge sharing. So over to you, Helen. Great. Thanks, Daisy. So to kick us off, we'd actually like to hear more from you. And we're going to move into a poll question. The question we want to know is, do you think public servants do enough sharing of knowledge, experiences and lessons learned with their peers? So you might want to reflect on how you feel this is in your department. Um, you might want to think about government as a whole. You might want to think about how public servants are perceived. So we just want to know, do you think the public servants do enough sharing of knowledge, experiences, and lessons learned with their peers? And once you've voted, feel free to elaborate on the chat. Um, we can go in and see what people are saying. I see we've got some results coming in. I think there's a pretty clear result coming here. Um, it looks like the majority of people are saying kind of, but there could be more. So that's right around 68% of people saying that, um, sort of hovering around there. And then 16% of saying, yes, people already do enough knowledge sharing, which is great. If you do feel that there's already enough knowledge sharing going on, it would be great to know how you see that happening. What does that look like? It's always really good to hear stories about knowledge sharing in government. And 13% of you said, no, you, you don't think there's enough happening at all, not even kind of. So that's a pretty interesting split. And I think good to know that there's definitely room for improvement there and room to grow. So hopefully we'll be able to provide some tips about how you can increase that knowledge sharing today. Let's go ahead and move on to the second poll, if that's all right. So our second question is, do you have the right tools to share knowledge with your peers? Reflect on what's available to you at work. Do you feel that you have the right tools to share knowledge with your peers? Would you say, yes, definitely have those resources, um, sort of. There could be more supports. Maybe you, you feel like you can 
start to share knowledge, but maybe if you had a bit more support, you could do it more effectively? Or no, do you think the, the resources just aren't there? You need some more resources. And again, if you want to elaborate in the chat and share either, yes, if you have those resources, what do, what do they look like? What kind of resources do you have to share knowledge? Or no, what kind of resources would be helpful for you? So feel free to elaborate either one in the chat. And I'll just give everybody another minute to respond. Very interested to see how people feel in terms of, of tools and, and what that really looks like. And we'll definitely talk a little bit about what those tools can look like, um, both at Apolitical and also beyond in your own governments. We're seeing, again, pretty clear results. Everybody's really voting for the middle ground today, um, which is interesting to see. We've got 66% of people saying, sort of, there could be more support. 18% of people saying, yes, you've got the right tools. That's fantastic. We're really glad to hear that. Again, feel free to share what those tools are, what they look like. Share tips with your fellow public servants who are here. And 14% of people have said no. You don't feel you've got the right tools to share knowledge with your peers. Um, and again, if you if you responded no, feel free to elaborate and share what kind of tools would be more helpful for you. Because that's you know great for us to know. And also maybe you'll find some ideas among the other public servants on this call, which means that you're already knowledge sharing. Uh, even by joining this call and engaging in the chat, you've already sort of started halfway there. And I'll go ahead and move on. Um, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. It's, it's really helpful for us to find out sort of what you're thinking and how you're approaching the conversation today. One of the challenges that we've been told about time and again by public servants is the highly siloed nature of work in government. So for example, somebody who's working on environmental policy might never actually interact with somebody who's working on educational policy, even if there might be some really natural points where their work could intersect. Now, this can make it really difficult to communicate with people outside of your immediate team or department, let alone trying to learn what other governments across the world are doing, which means you might end up missing things. So breaking down these silos and actually sharing this knowledge is a really key part of Apolitical's mission. We want to enable peer-to-peer -peer learning in government so the best ideas and policies can be shared and have the maximum impact possible for citizens. And public servants' lives are also made easier, and sharing knowledge is a key part of doing that better. So I want to talk a little bit about how we can think about knowledge sharing in the public service and sort of maybe knowledge more generally. So all of us run the risk of thinking we know more than we do. And we have to constantly remind ourselves that there's probably more we don't know than what we actually do know. And most of us work within our comfort zone of what we know. Once we step out of this zone, we're in what we call the stretch zone. And beyond that, you start to feel out of your depth. And that's when you get into that outer ring you can see there, the panic zone. And we definitely stop being productive once we reach the panic zone. But when you work with others, you can see that their comfort zone overlaps with your stretch zone and vice versa. And this is really where learning happens as we work with each other and share our knowledge and skills. You can really widen that circle. So you see that the comfort zone circle is quite small. So the things that you're able to comfortably do might be somewhat limited and you might be really strong in those areas. But if someone else on your team or beyond your department has skills in that stretch zone, you can actually widen both of your circles and teach each other. So why knowledge sharing? What's the point? Why should you actually be sharing knowledge in government? There are a few key benefits that you can see here. The first one is once you actually start knowledge sharing, you streamline your work and save time and money by preventing duplicated efforts. So if government A has a really fantastic environmental policy that they've implemented and it's worked really well, and government B has a somewhat similar population and similar conditions, but they don't actually know what government A has been doing, then they're just going to end up duplicating the same research, the same work, when really they could be sharing methods. The second is to enable quicker and better decision making. Since you're actually able to base your decisions on people's past experiences rather than just feeling like you're guessing, there's also reduced loss of know-how. So if you've just spent time learning a new skill or really developing your expertise in a topic, that knowledge doesn't have to stop with you. You can actually even try it out after this presentation if you'd like. You can think of one thing that you learned today or maybe something that surprised you and share it with your team at your next meeting. And voila, you're already knowledge sharing. And the fourth, ultimately, government is about delivering services and serving citizens. And knowledge sharing can help you do this better and make you a more effective public servant. At a fundamental level, knowledge sharing gets us talking and exchanging ideas with people we might not usually come into contact with. I mean, much like this presentation, we're speaking to you from London. You might reach people outside of your field, your department, and even your country. And this difference of approach and thinking and learning from each other is really where that innovation can start to happen. Um, and as promised, we're going to give you some kind of practical advice for how you can start doing that. So we've broken this down into two steps. So the first step that we've identified um, or lesson as it's put there for knowledge sharing is really about reflection. So before you even start to knowledge share, you should take a step back and think, what are my own strengths and what are my weaknesses? Where do I have gaps in my knowledge? And by seeking out people who are different to us, um, different department, different background, which is not something that we typically do, we can start to fill those knowledge gaps. 
Another thing you can do to practice self-reflection is to think um, about how you identify yourself at work. So when you think about who you work for, what comes to mind? Is it your team? Is it your department? Or maybe it's your government. From now on, you should try and think about yourself as working for the government as a whole. And when you do this, it expands your horizons about who it is possible to collaborate with. And it can also help us get out of thinking in us and then binary terms. The second uh, lesson or step that we've got about knowledge sharing is giving feedback. So knowledge sharing obviously requires people to talk to each other and give each other feedback. Um, and a big part of this is about building trust with each other. So individuals have a responsibility to speak their truth and leaders must also walk the talk by encouraging honest feedback from their team and praising people when they give this. There's sometimes an unwritten rule that we're not allowed to kind of talk back or trash the big boss's ideas, but this can actually be damaging in the long run. Um, since teams who communicate honestly with each other are often the teams who can tackle the big issues that we face or that governments face. Obviously, when you're thinking about giving feedback, a huge part of this is about doing it with respect and kindness. So you should always have that front of mind um, when you're giving people honest feedback. And we've got here some tips um, for garnering feedback, which hopefully you can start using right away. So I've already touched on this a bit, but the first thing really is about creating a safe space for feedback. So that requires trust and being real with each other. And obviously that comes with a bit of vulnerability as well. And a good way you can kind of build the relationship and the foundations for this kind of relationship is to get to know each other outside of a work basis. So don't just say, you know, oh, where's that report? Ask how their weekend was, how their family are, even maybe their pet cat and get to know each other on a bit more of a deeper level. At the team level, um, after every meeting, you can ask how people um, thought it went. So what did they learn? What did they think could have been done better? Um, and by doing this, you're going to bring forward new thoughts, ideas and challenges about the direction you've decided to take. And being critical of the choices that have been made is often a good thing in government because it can help you to check that the direction you have chosen will best serve the people. The third one here is round tables. So at your next meeting, make sure you go around every person at the table and that they say something to make sure you're hearing as many voices as possible. Now, this might seem a bit scary for introverts amongst us, but we should think about it as calling people into the conversation rather than calling people out for not saying anything. Or another thing you can do um, if this doesn't really feel like it would work in your team is collecting anonymous feedback. So you could do this via a Google form or even um, putting like slips of paper into a box or something and then reading those out um, during the next meeting. The last one I've got there is phrasing your opinions as questions. So next time you have an idea or a thought, instead of kind of just saying it, instead you should say, oh, you know, what do you think about this? Um, and that way you hopefully get to hear people's kind of unfiltered feedback, what they might not necessarily be comfortable sharing with you in the first place. So I think my tip would be sort of coming from the person who's actually requesting the feedback. I think sometimes it can be hard to be really receptive to feedback, especially if it feels critical or it feels like someone is pointing out something that could be done better. But I think having a mindset that's really open to that kind of feedback and again, requesting it. So actively seeking out that feedback, I think, can make you feel more receptive to anything that people have to say. And keeping in mind that if someone's sharing feedback, it's because they really care. It's because they want to help you do better and they want to help you get better at your job and, and do things more efficiently. So I think I think just being receptive to any feedback that people do share and having a sort of open mind is um, is really helpful. Um, so as I said at the beginning, uh, Apolitical's kind of core mission is really about knowledge sharing to improve government. Um, so with this in mind, we're quickly going to touch now on three different ways that you can get involved with Apolitical and start knowledge sharing uh, today. So the first one is join one of our workshops. Um, we often have workshops kind of once or twice a week. Um, we have um, speakers from all over the world, all different governments talking about um, a topic um, with a really lively Q&A um, and chat function going where people are sharing resources, tips, things that they've learned, books they've read. Um, and that's a really fantastic way to kind of connect with people that you might not normally do. 
Um, the next thing which we already mentioned, um, write an article. So by doing this, you become a member contributor uh, and you can really profile the work that your team has been doing um, and what you've learned from it. And the third one we've got is co-creating a learning resource with Helen and I's team. Um, so this is when we've worked with government um, teams or departments to create learning resources either for their whole department or all of Apoliticals membership. Um, so some topics we've done this before have been uh, working from home, working remotely. We've done this on policy just a general policy boot camp so there's a real broad um, range of topics that you can work with us on so that's kind of the knowledge sharing part of this um, talk wrapped up and now we're going to find out from Helen how that leads into innovation thanks Daisy and I should just say we will share some of those links um, about how to do all of those things that Daisy just mentioned at the end so we're going to move into talking a bit more about innovation and like we did with our last section we'd actually like to start the conversation by hearing from you and finding out how you feel so at this point, we're going to do a word cloud on the topic of innovation. So we want you to share with us, what do you think about when you think about innovation? How does it make you feel? What does it make you think about? While you're having a think, maybe we can share ours. Um, Daisy, do you want to share what your, your word when you think of innovation is? I think for me, it's creativity. I think, I think mine would probably be improve. So innovation, not just as doing something differently, but actually trying to make something better. Um, and it seems like we've got other people sort of thinking along the same lines. I hope we didn't influence you too much. We've got interesting. OK, so new, innovating, new, that totally makes sense. Improvement, development. I think those words about sort of changing things for the better. Upgrade. I like that. That's a fun way of thinking about it. So taking something and making it a bit better. New is really staying as the key word there. And we've got some in the chat as well. Improvement, enhanced, out of the box. I like that. That's fun. Um, improvement from the existing one. I think improvement is sort of a strong lead here. I'll just give everybody a minute to keep thinking, share those words. I think we've got development staying there as well. A lot about, I, I like creativity as well. I think that's a really good one. Like Daisy said, having innovation be sort of something new and creative and out of the box. I think that was a really great one as well. Advancement, that's another really great one that I've seen in the chat. So not just changing something, but actually moving it forward um, and making things better accelerate ease of doing business there's some really great thoughts that people are sharing here um, and that's really great to see so we've still got all of those coming in here i'll just give another minute and then maybe we can keep the word cloud there and i'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we think about innovation got some more coming in in the chat modernization new acceptance that's a really interesting one so innovation not just as continually changing things but maybe also taking a moment to accept uh, the way some things are, or deciding what things you actually need to innovate, moving forward, new ideas. Okay, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. That's um, It's a really helpful way to see what everybody's thinking, what page everybody's on when we think about innovation. It's great that I think everybody sees innovation as really forward-looking and positive. I, I didn't see a lot of negative words, interestingly, in that chat. I didn't see a lot of people saying, oh, innovation is scary, or innovation is is too much. Um, so I think maybe we've got an innovative bunch of people on the call today, which is good to see. So innovation in government is a term that gets thrown around a lot, but it can be difficult to define. So I want to sort of start us off by looking at what innovation is not. Um, we've seen loads of definitions from all of you about what innovation is, what it makes you think of, but innovation doesn't exclusively have to do with the use of new technology, nor does it even have to be something new. So I know new was one of the big words that we saw a lot. Um, but it doesn't just have to be that, because when we start reinventing policies just for the sake of it, it's when we start wasting time and money and actually decrease our productivity. Often there are simpler tried and tested fixes out there. So I want to share a few examples with you. Um, we had a Public Service Team of the Year award last year, and one of our categories was in citizen-centered innovation. And I want to share with you some of our finalists just to give you an idea of what innovation can be. So one of our finalists was the Housing Institute of the City of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and they involve community stakeholders in participatory roundtables so their voices can be heard throughout the process of slum upgrading. The second is Family Safety Hub at the Government of Australian Capital Territory, and it's a co-designed innovation hub that uses human-centered design practices to create and test solutions for those affected by domestic and family violence, involving organizations from multiple sectors. And finally, the South African Social Security Agency, WhatsApp fault reporting line. The agency launched a WhatsApp service in July 2019 to deal with social grant queries. Users will be able to ask what uh, to use WhatsApp to ask questions about payments or to request home visits if they're too sick or frail to visit the agency in person. So these three examples that I've just named, um, these aren't necessarily huge groundbreaking innovations, 
roundtables, human-centered design, and WhatsApp are definitely not new concepts or new tech that they spent a long time developing. But by actually applying them to these unique challenges, these teams were able to innovate and improve services for citizens. So sometimes we just need to look around us to see which tools and methods work either in our own countries or further afield. Research conducted by the Danish government, often cited as one of the most inventive in the world, found that most innovations introduced by its public servants are inspired by or copied from other departments. So I want to do a quick quiz. So in Denmark, what percentage of Danish public sector innovations are inspired by or copied from other department solutions? Do you think it is 15 percent, 36 percent, 52 percent or 73 percent? So just take a quick second. It's just a really quick quiz. See what you think. What percent do you think of Danish public sector innovations are inspired by or copied from other department solutions? Again, keeping in mind this is seen as a really innovative public sector. What do you think? Give everybody just a minute, answer, and then let's see what we have as our results. So only 6% of you think that it's 15%. So a fairly low number. People are, people are thinking maybe it's a little bit more. 19% of you said 36%. 39% of you now 40, hovering around there, so 52%. So that's the majority. The majority of you think that 52% of those innovations are inspired by or copied from other department solutions. And then 33%, so about a third of you, think it's 73%. So I can reveal the right answer is actually 73%. So in fact, 73% of innovations in the Danish public sector are inspired by or copied from other department solutions. So this is why knowledge sharing is so critical to innovation, because you can really pick up other bits of policies that other governments are doing and apply them in your own context. Um, another example, the UK's government digital service shared code and lessons from its successful digital transformation process with New Zealand to help it get a head start on providing digital services. So we see this all over. When, when governments are actually able to communicate and to share knowledge with each other, you can get these really fantastic innovations that, again, don't necessarily require a huge technological development or a really groundbreaking innovation. It can just be taking a new idea and applying it in your context. Great. So, yeah, as we heard, Denmark is one of the most innovative governments in the world. Um, so it's no surprise that one of the world's oldest government innovation labs um, started there, Mind Lab. I'm not sure if many of you will have heard of it. Um, I think it's now closed down, um, but it was one of the original uh, innovation labs. Now, after it closed down, its former director, Thomas Prenn, wrote an article for Apolitical, which we can also share afterwards. Um, so he's one of our member contributors, and he shared nine lessons that he had learned as his time of director, all about innovation. And we're going to quickly go through those nine lessons with you now. So the first lesson is failure is not an option. So it kind of goes without saying, but in political systems, failure is not appreciated because it can expose the minister or the ministry to public scrutiny. And obviously for public servants, that's a huge concern for various reasons. So it's really imperative that you vigorously return to the problem you're trying to solve until it is resolved, no matter the hurdles that you come up against. The second learning here is climb down from the ivory tower. So kind of by their very nature, innovation units or labs or teams often define themselves in opposition to the rest of the organisation, or at least outside of the rest of the organisation. But this kind of arrogant kind of attitude, as it can come across sometimes, can be counterproductive. So Thomas reminds us we should always be humble, no matter the effort, um, and remind yourself that success is never yours alone. In fact, it's actually better, it makes you stronger if success in your innovation happens at the core of the system and not on its outskirts. Number three is about not promoting methods. So whilst design methods might be easily applicable, they don't necessarily usher in sustainable change to how an organisation works. Instead, when we're doing innovation, what we should really be doing is striving to leave a cultural dent in everything that we do. And we can do this by challenging inherent assumptions and behaviours. The fourth learning here is be generous. So ideas, successes, appreciation, it should all be shared. It should all be passed along. Um, and this kind of comes back to the knowledge sharing, I suppose. So you should um, infuse what you're doing into the organisation as a whole um, and really let that kind of spirit take root. Only then will it become relevant and truly um, scalable to valuable proportions. The fifth learning we've got here is stop dreaming. So above all, be realistic, be pragmatic and be sensible. 
And don't underestimate that changing government um, and political structures is a tough job. Um, and remind yourself that many of the processes and behaviours uh, you'll find in government are actually there for a good reason. So instead of committing to big ambitious, um, change what's changeable um, and do so to create real value for the government and also for society. Number six is about being an awesome colleague. Um, so it's about building friendships with your colleagues, having coffee, being ready with advice and building them up when they've done a good job. And that also comes back to building those relationships so you can share honestly with each other and give each other feedback, which, as we've seen, is really crucial when we're learning from each other and innovating. Number seven is about celebrating nuance. So you should acknowledge that in policymaking and in government, there aren't any perfect targets for your beautifully designed silver bullet. Instead, you should really be curious and pay attention to what's on the periphery of the problem, the solution and the organisation. You can sometimes ignore hierarchical legitimacy and you should praise anyone who brings you surprising perspective from the corners of the organisation. Um, so that goes back as well about um, encouraging people who give you feedback that you didn't, that surprises you or challenges you. Number eight is creating legitimacy through relations. So policy making um, and government is complex. It's often a fast moving target and it can be difficult to draw baselines uh, and isolate and measure the impact of interventions. So obviously that's bad news for organisations that kind of thrive on evidence um, by numbers. But if you focus on building genuine, compassionate relationships, you actually fortify the overall organisational narrative of the value that your innovation team or lab brings. And hopefully it will help you stay around a little bit longer. And the last learning here is stay true. So always remember your initial ambition and the problem you were trying to solve. And when turbulence arises, when you come into difficulty, stick with it. So we want to ask you a quick poll question now, um, and that's about which of these nine lessons rings most true to you? Um, what feels kind of the most important, would you say? So there's quite a few there. There's nine lessons. So we had number one, failure is not an option. Number two, climb down from the ivory tower. C, don't promote methods. Be generous. Stop dreaming. Be an awesome colleague. Celebrate nuance. Create legitimacy through relations. And finally, stay true. You can see, I guess we're all quite spread out because there's nine options, but I'm seeing some kind of clear ones that are being popular. We've got stay true, be generous, failure is not an option, be an awesome colleague. Makes me happy to see that lots of you are picking on that one. So we'll just give a moment longer. Those numbers staying pretty, pretty similar there. So I end the poll there. So we've got 14% of you thinking failure is not an option is the most kind of true um, lesson. Then we've got climb down from the ivory tower, 6%. Don't promote methods. Okay, not many of you agreeing with that one, or at least not thinking it's the most important with just 1%. 19% of us saying be generous. 3% is stop dreaming. I guess that's kind of nice. We can dream. <laughs> it's always good to do that. 12% be an awesome colleague. 1% of you thinking that celebrating nuance is the most kind of true or valuable lesson. 9% creating legitimacy through relations. And the clear winner there is stay true, 29%. And I guess that is kind of encompasses a lot of the, the lessons that we learned there. So I think the, the kind of the overarching thing here is that regardless of how innovations are achieved, um, the best public sector innovations take a system that might be slow, hard or inefficient and make it easy to use and impactful. And the innovation might actually lie in changing how public servants work rather than introducing a whole new program or policy. So I'll talk a little bit about how productivity ties in with innovation, but I first just wanted to talk a little bit about sort of where we're getting our information about productivity. So we've run a few different courses on this topic, and we've recently put together um, one of our first paid courses on productivity, where we interviewed public sector um, employees, public servants from across the globe. So the innovations and the ideas that we have to share with you in the, in the realm of productivity today have really come from them. Um, so while innovations definitely increase public sector efficiency, it also has to be a two-way street. If you don't have productive public uh, servants within your organization, it's doubtful that they'll be able to introduce or roll out these innovations with maximum effectiveness and impact. 
Now, so far, we've mostly been talking about the big picture. And so for this final part of the presentation, we really want to zoom it back down to the individual and start talking about what you can do, starting with yourself, that will have an impact on public sector productivity, and then in turn on innovation. Because as we've said, innovation doesn't have to be those huge, big, overarching, sweeping changes. It can really just be small changes. And that can really start with you. So this poll question is, do you struggle with productivity at work? Um, there's no shame in this answer. This is definitely not to uh, make anyone feel bad for having ever struggled with productivity. Would you say you frequently struggle with productivity? Sometimes struggle with productivity? No, not often. So maybe there's, there's a couple times, but not frequently. Or no, never. Um, and really, I, I don't know how you do it for the people who are, are never struggling with productivity at work. Um, if that's you, please share your secrets with us because it sounds like you could probably be up here giving this presentation with us as well. Um, and I know even though even though Daisy and I are sort of sharing our tips with productivity, it's definitely a constant learning process for us as well. So we'll give everybody a minute to respond. This is just sort of a general, do you struggle with productivity at work in general? Um, we're gonna ask more sort of specific question about this in a moment, but I'll just give everybody one second and then I'm going to go ahead and end this poll so you can move on to the next one. So 10% of you said that you frequently struggle with productivity at work. There's definitely, again, no shame in that. We're gonna share some productivity tips here that might help you a bit. 65% um, of you say yes, sometimes, which I think is, is probably a reasonable assessment for many of us. Um, it's, it's hard to be productive all the time. 21% of you say you don't often struggle with productivity. Um, and 3% of you said no, never. So again, if you are a no, never person and you've never struggled with productivity, please share your top tips um, because we want to learn from you as well. We're here to knowledge share. We're here to share share our best practices. So, so please feel free to share those in the chat and I'll try and keep an eye on those to share as I go along. One last poll question here. Um, we want to know, do you think you've become more or less productive over the past few months? So obviously 2020 has been a strange year. We've had COVID-19, um, this has sent many of us into work from home. I know our company has been working remotely since about March. So do, how do you feel this has affected your productivity? Even if you're in the office, I know there have been a lot of big changes. There's a lot going on in the world. So do you think you've been more or less productive over the past few months? Have you been more productive? Maybe stayed about the same, no change? Or have you become less productive? So I'm interested to see here. Everybody works differently, which is definitely one of the things we're going to draw out here in our section about productivity. So again, no shame in, in any of these responses. Um, I'm just going to take a quick look in the chat um, and see what people are saying as well. Some people have said no change, um, more productive because workload has drastically increased. Um, that's a really great point as well. Productivity isn't just focused on how you as an individual are feeling. It's also sometimes focused on what you're being asked to do. Um, some people saying no change, less productive because of the pandemic. Really interesting seeing some of these responses. Some people saying even with the pandemic and limitations, you need to be more productive to cope with the needs of your agency um, and definitely maybe a unique concern to the public service. You sort of are always responsive to the needs of the public, whether or not you're feeling your most productive. So I'm just going to end this poll and bring up our results. Um, so 41% of you have actually become more productive. And from the chat, it's sounding like that's whether or not you wanted to. So maybe you've become more productive because you just have more you have to do. Maybe you've found that you actually really love working from home or any configuration that you've figured out over the past few months. Um, and 28% of you have stayed the same. Maybe you haven't been as affected or maybe you've just sort of rolled with it and you've, you've figured out what works for you. And then 29% have become less productive, um, which is really interesting. And I think the, the main point that I want to draw out of this isn't necessarily that circumstances make us more or less productive every time. I think it's that people react differently to changing circumstances and people really have different ways of approaching productivity, which brings me into my next point. The first thing you can do when it comes to actually increasing your productivity, so now we're gonna be getting into these really helpful concrete tips, is recognizing what kind of productivity style you have. So I'm gonna talk about four broad categories. Um, you might be a combination of these categories or you might really strongly identify with one. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about each one. And then at the end, we're going to ask you to decide which one sounds the most like you. And as I share a bit about each of these types, I'm also going to share some tips. So either if you are one of these four types, you'll find some tips for helping yourself work better. Um, or if you work with someone who's like this, you'll figure out how to make, make their work experience better. So maybe if you manage people or you work really closely with others on your team, you might wanna think about how you can apply these tips to working with them. So the first type is the prioritizer. So the prioritizer 
describes people who are very goal oriented and competitive. So these are analytical people. They approach their tasks with a lot of logic and prioritizers are very good at setting the appropriate amount of time to deliver their tasks. So goal oriented, competitive and logical. Those are the sort of three hallmarks of the prioritizers. So a couple of tips about how you can make the most if you're a prioritizer or if you work with one. Playing into the prioritizer's competitive nature by setting goals for each assignment can help give them a productivity boost because they have really concrete sort of goals to work against. This can also be done by trying to maximize efficiency by cutting down on the time it takes to do routine tasks, such as responding to emails more quickly by writing new templates. So this might be somebody who's just really trying to maximize their efficiency, get those goals done, and you want to think about how you can help them or yourself uh, do that better. So that's the prioritizer, the first of the four. The second is the planner. So people that fall into this productivity style are incredibly detail oriented and organized. They find making lists and setting out tasks before a project begins helpful for being productive. They can be really good at looking at the fine print, but they don't always love being spontaneous or not having an agenda. So if you're a planner, or again, if you know one, you might wanna consider setting micro to-do lists that break your tasks down into smaller chunks to give yourself a productivity boost. I don't know about you, um, but I find it really satisfying to cross something off my to-do list. That's a hint, I'm definitely a planner. Um, but planners' organizational skills will help them excel at meetings and managing projects that have a strict deadline because it really lets them bring out their organizational side and that list making and that really detail-oriented focus. So the third one is the arranger. So people that fall into this category are really instinctive and have a knack for knowing what needs to get done and working with people to achieve it. So these people tend to be really great communicators and facilitators and partnering with colleagues is their specialty. So a tip for this one, breaking up your tasks with coffee breaks scattered in between can help arrangers thrive. So this is because they might thrive on that connection with other people on their team. Um, these may not be necessarily the most detail oriented li and list making people. They might be people who have a better sense of the big picture. Um, and again, you might fall into a couple of these categories or you might identify with all four, that's totally fine. Um, you might find that you're sort of a mix of them and one day you're an arranger and one day you're a planner. Um, that totally helps too. So the fourth one is the visualizer. So people that fall under the visualizer style really thrive under pressure and like a challenge. So they have a knack for formulating novel ideas and visualizers are great at seeing the bigger picture and how things fall into place. So you might see a visualizer in a strategic role, or you might be able to bring out your inner visualizer when you're given a strategic responsibility. So a top tip is to allow visualizers the opportunity to be creative in their problem solving. This will help them become more productive. Their ability to consider outcomes in the future makes them a valuable asset for projects that don't have a clear end goal. So you can see where sometimes the visualizer and the planner might have sort of complementary strengths. So when we were talking about those sort of circles of your comfort zone, your stretch zone, and your panic zone, um, you might find a visualizer's comfort zone is in having these really amorphous projects to work towards that don't have a clear end goal and maybe don't have the details, but they've got this great big picture. And then they might work with a planner whose comfort zone is in those details and in the list making. But then when they work together, you can really broaden that circle and you can get the whole picture. So I think we've had a few people sharing in the chat already, but we're just gonna pop it up as a poll question. Um, what productivity style do you think you are? Which one of these really resonates with you? I know a lot of people are saying that they're visualizers. We've got a couple of arrangers. Um, Daisy, which one do you think you are? I'm a planner with you. I love a list. We've got, yeah, we've got a couple of uh, planners on our teams. Daisy and I are both big lovers of a to-do list. Although love it can be overwhelming sometimes when you're constantly like the list is never ending. So yeah, it can be good to mix in some other kind of styles there and other ways of organizing your work. Definitely true. Yeah, maybe you sort of want to try and learn from other colleagues. I know one one colleague that Daisy and I work with, I would say is definitely more of a visualizer. Um, and she has a really great sense for big picture um, and, and strategy. And so I think that that can be really helpful when you have complementary sort of abilities in a team. Um, and then you can learn from each other. You can sort of learn how to apply that way of thinking in your own work. So I've pulled up this poll question. We're seeing a relatively even split. I think there's a, a slight majority going for planner. Um, and maybe you're just trying to, to identify with Daisy and me because we've both said we're list makers and talked about it a lot. Um, or we might just have a lot of really detail oriented people on this call and in the public service in general, maybe. So I'm just gonna end the poll and bring up the results. We have a quarter of you said you're a prioritizer. 
Um, 36 percent of you are planners. 15 percent are arrangers. Interesting that that's not necessarily the highest one, um, maybe because it doesn't feel quite as tangible. Um, the arranger is a bit more of like working with people, maybe great facilitators, great communicators. Um, and 21 percent of you are visualizers. So I think it's really good to see that we have quite a spread across all four, because, again, when you bring in these different skills, different ways of thinking into the same team or at least into into conversation, that's when you really start learning from each other. Again, sharing knowledge. If you think that um, there's a, a type that we've missed here, um, if, if you feel that you're a type that's not represented on that, you know, four part scale, please feel free to share that in the chat and let us know um, what productivity style you have that we that we maybe haven't thought about before. Great. So, yeah, once you know what productivity style you have, um, it's really about optimizing your routine to manage your energy instead of your time. And this is really important because none of us can work at peak performance all day. So the first step for doing this is find out um, which time you function best. Now, for most people, that's in the morning. Um, and once you've identified that time, you should concentrate on work that requires deep thinking. So that might be speech writing, uh, strategy, governance board planning um, and other high value tasks. The next step um, is about labeling your week's tasks. So what you should do is you should put them into different buckets, ranging from easy to hard, and you can label them on like a sliding scale. Um, and you should base this on how much time they're going to take, their intellectual difficulty and also the uncertainty involved. And then once you've labeled the tasks, try and limit yourself to three hard tasks a day and do these when you're at your most productive. And you can save more mindless tasks like responding to emails, scheduling or setting agendas for when you have your productivity slumps. So that's kind of the two steps. So find your most productive time and then organize your tasks accordingly. And just to finish this off, we're going to share three quick tips um, which we think will help you become more productive. So the first one is forming good habits. It's often said that smart habits can be the difference between success and failure. Um, and habits should be four things, obvious, attractive, easy and satisfying. Now, a political CEO, Robin Scott, um, has told us about the 30 second habit that she has. So what this is, it's after every meeting, lecture or meaningful discussion you have, take 30 seconds, no more or no less, and write down your key learnings. And once you get into this habit, it can help you interpret information, understand others' needs and prioritise what's important. And over time, if you practice this regularly, it can actually change how you pay attention to other people, um, which in turn can help improve your decision making. Um, I think mine would be having a good routine. So having a morning routine definitely helps me getting up, having coffee, breakfast, having a bit of a stretch and move and also taking breaks, um, I find is really helpful. So even if that's just a five, 10 minute break to go to the kitchen, I mean, this is when I'm working from home, obviously, but go to the kitchen, make a cup of coffee, make a tea, maybe have a walk around the block. Um, I find sort of midday walks really helpful, even if it's just getting a little bit of sunlight for, for five or 10 minutes, um, forming those habits that will make me more focused, even if it does mean stepping away from my computer for a few minutes. Yeah, and please share any habits that you have that you think help make you more productive. Um, our second tip here is eliminate distractions. So email is um, something that we all spend a lot of our time on um, for public servants. It's often a key way um, that they communicate, um, but it can also be one of our biggest uh, distractions. So the average office worker receives 126 messages each day and devotes around 28 percent of their working week to emails. And we're often opening a new message within six seconds of receiving it. So we kind of get into this habit of we never know when an important email is going to drop into our inbox. So we should always be monitoring our inbox. And there's this kind of obsession about um, reaching inbox zero. So clearing your inbox. It's a very satisfying task, but it might not actually be that productive. Um, research has shown that any disruption you have to your workflow, for example, going to your inbox and opening an email can take you up to 15 minutes to recover from 15 minutes to get back into your kind of flow. So some things you can do to eliminate distractions are putting your phone on do not disturb mode, maybe downloading an app to block social media so you're not distracted, closing unnecessary tabs before you start working, putting on a playlist which can help you or maybe even using earplugs to block out unnecessary noise and cleaning your desk is a really important one. Um, so people with neat offices are more productive and less frustrated whilst they're working. And researchers have actually found that a clean desk can help you stick with the task for more than one and a half times as long. So declutter, um, that should help you be more productive. 
And the final one here is learn to say no. So often we want to say yes to many of the tasks that come our way. Um, but this kind of a yes culture can really be um, it can be like harmful. Um, women in particular feel obliged to say yes and guilty when they don't. Um, but next time someone asks you something, think, is this opportunity really worth my time? Do I really need to be saying yes to this? Great. Thanks, Daisy. Um, there, there are also a lot of great comments in the chat with people talking about how they manage um, things that sort of pose distractions to them as well. And that's really helpful. Um, I, th I think the biggest thing is just to tie all of these pieces together. So this knowledge sharing, this innovation and this productivity piece, because they are really closely connected. I mean, being a more productive public servant, figuring out how you like to work, what works for you can really help you feed into that innovation culture. Um, you, you sort of really do have to start with yourself. And again, innovation doesn't have to be big sweeping changes. It can be those small micro changes about just improving the way that things work, which again can really start with yourself. And finally, sharing knowledge with other public servants is really at the heart of innovation. It's how you learn from other people. It's how you figure out what's going to work for yourself. So if you can start knowledge sharing, if you can start communicating with others, that's really when the learning bit starts. And again, it, it sort of is a, is a virtuous circle. You end up with being more productive in the end. So I think we, these can all really feed into each other. So, so I really want to give you the last word. It would be great if you could just share a quick, your, your sort of final one word takeaway from today's discussion. Just share your, your one thing that you're gonna take away. Maybe you're gonna share with your team how you're feeling about today's call. If you could just share that in the chat and then I'll read some of these out from that chat. Daisy, what, what's your one word takeaway from today's conversation? I think fun. Um, it's been really great to talk to people that we don't normally get to talk to. And I hope that you've all learned something and grateful as well for having the opportunity and for the centre for inviting us to talk. Absolutely. I see some great ones already inspired, helpful. I think mine would be connection, um, because I think really at the heart of sharing knowledge is just connecting and communicating with other people, having talks like this, having events, having having conversations. I think that's really at the heart of how we share knowledge and then at the heart of what sparks that sort of innovative spirit um, and can spark that that new learning. So we've got really great responses in the chat. Eye opener, openness, inspired, focus, innovation, teamwork. I love that. Uh, somebody said, stay awesome, guys. So maybe you're really inspired to be that great colleague who's setting up coffee chats and connecting with your colleagues, um, engaging, true connection, communication, awareness on productivity, um, practical, inspired, sharing knowledge, enlightening, really great responses there. Um, again, thank you so much for being such an engaged group. Um, I think really, again, the heart of what we're talking about is exactly what we're doing right now, is sharing knowledge. You're sharing knowledge with us. We're sharing our knowledge with you. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we're each going to go away with new ideas and, and sort of new innovations that we can take into our work. Again, even if it's just introducing a new innovation that's a 10 minute walk at lunchtime, um, even those can really have a huge difference to to our, our days and then to our work. Thank you very much, Helen and Daisy. Uh, I, the, I've, I'm seeing that the chat is overflowing with the participation of the audiences and I've never seen uh, our audience has um, engaged this before. So we'll take a few questions, um, Daisy and Helen, is that okay? We'll read some of the questions from the chat Definitely. box. All right, so uh, first question, which is a common problem for innovation in the workplace or any organization for that matter, is how do we pitch innovative ideas in the, uh, to the upper management so sometimes they have a conflict with the beliefs or what the upper management has in mind. So what do you suggest from the people in the rank and file positions or their staff to do to have a better innovation in the workplace or in their public sector organization? So what do you suggest that they can do? I think the first thing that I would say, and then Helen, please um, add in anything, is that you don't want to be going to your kind of superiors and saying, this is what you're doing wrong. This is, you know, this is your fault. This is bad. This is a problem. You kind of want to go with a solution. So you want to set the tone for something that's going to be collaborative and something that you can work on together to improve um, rather than there kind of be any feelings of kind of accusations that they're not doing their job or they failed in some way because that's just going to get you off on the wrong kind of step. So it's coming with this attitude of collaboration um, and looking at solutions rather than problems, I think. 
Yeah, right. definitely. I, I think just just to briefly add to that, uh, I think sort of the two the two components that I would recommend. One is to start small. As we've said, innovation doesn't have to be a huge, massive change. It can just be changing something very small. So I think maybe coming to a superior with that idea, um, a small change. And again, like Daisy said, showing how it's going to make their lives better. One really great thing that I think one of our public servants said on a workshop is sometimes you have to show people that there's more danger in not innovating than there is in actually innovating. So they have more to lose by not trying something new than they do by actually taking that leap and trying something. Um, and I think the second thing is if you can, it can really help to find a sort of champion or an advocate. So find other people who you work with who feel the same way, who maybe have the same goals and see if you can work together. Um, again, it's not, you're not going around anyone, but you're just trying to build a little bit of a coalition of people who have that innovative spirit so that you then have people to support you as well. Another question here from Mr. Abad Jr. Vitaliano. So he was asking about, is there an instance that an innovation can cause chaos rather than the other way around? I'm sure there probably have been instances. I think it's about being flexible and not being kind of bloody minded about introducing the innovation that you think is going to work and having kind of the overarching goal of improving services is really important. So if it's not going to improve services for citizens, don't keep with something if it's clearly not working. Um, I think it's about being mindful that it's okay to scale back and it's okay to say that didn't work and that's okay. Um, but being humble about that and being honest about when things don't work. So for the third question from Rosalind and Kevin, they are asking, what if there are some employees who cannot adopt the innovation? So how do you implement innovation in the agency or in the organization if some people are against it or they don't want to adapt to new innovations or technology? Sometimes it's the elders or sometimes it's uh, the other employees that are not adept with such kind of changes. So what are your tips to address this kind of problems in adopting innovation? Sure. So, so I think the first thing is really just to meet people where they are. If you have someone who really doesn't know how to use, say, a new piece of technology, you don't want to go about it by shaming them for not understanding how to use it. You really need to meet them where they are. And maybe that means taking an extra half hour to walk them through why this is actually a better system. Show them how to use it. Take the time with them. You know, you don't need to be condescending. It's not it's sort of not their fault that they don't necessarily understand this piece of technology. But you want to bring people along this journey with you rather than just sort of implementing a new change top down and expecting people to keep up and sort of run after you. So yeah, I would say meet people where they are. Yeah, for me as well, I would say um, it's about making them feel like they've got a stake in the changes or the innovations that you want to um, that you want to introduce, because once they feel bought in and like um, they're part of it as well, hopefully some of their kind of reluctance or skepticism will fall away. So be inclusive with it. Um, don't kind of force things on them, but say, you know, you could be a part of this as well um, and go with that kind of mindset. Another question, kind of similar to the question that was previously stated by Patricia Servas and Jennifer Silvestre. It's about what are the ways to make the organization work harmoniously, knowing that there are several type of productivity styles in the organization. So how do we harmonize people with the different styles in an organization? This one would be about there's kind of two things. Firstly, you can delegate tasks where people are kind of flourish with them. So if you know, like we said, you know, you've got the arranger and they're really great at facilitation, well, have them facilitate your meetings. If you've got the visualizer and they're great at strategy, have them kind of run a brainstorm. Um, but I think there's also something about um, incorporating different ways of working. So don't just have one style of organizing your team's work, because if that doesn't fit in with someone's productivity style, they're going to suffer. So I think it's about um, kind of delegating work where it seems appropriate, but also having a mix of kind of um, styles in the way that you arrange your work. I think the point shouldn't be to bring everyone in line so that you all have the same working style, because I think it's actually a real strength when you have a team made up of people who have all of these different strengths and ways of working, because again, then you can learn from each other. So maybe you want someone on your team to hold a strategy session and teach people how to think a bit more strategically. Maybe you want your planner to have a session about how to you know, make great to-do lists and keep track of them. Um, so I think there are ways that you can really capitalize on people's strengths and, and like Daisy said, set up a work environment where everyone can thrive. All right, so we're down to the last question for this session. Jubilee is asking if she has a good idea that she wants to share, but she doesn't have the confidence to share those ideas. What are your tips for those kind of people who are afraid or they, want, they don't want to get judged or they don't want to rock the boat? 
on sharing those kinds of innovative ideas that maybe they are just in their mind that they don't want to say it out loud. So what, how, what kind of tips can we do to those kinds of uh, instances? This is one thing that we actually said in the presentation about presenting your ideas um, or your thoughts as opinions. So you could kind of, if you don't want to feel like you're kind of staking your claim to that idea, you can raise it, you know, oh, I heard about this the other day. What do you think about that? To kind of get the conversation moving and see what people's initial reactions are to it. Um, and another way, although this might be trickier, is to see if there's any way that you can anonymously give ideas. Um, so maybe bring that as a suggestion to your manager or your team leader about having some kind of anonymous um, ideas collection. Um, but that might not be easy for everyone to kind of implement. I think another sure. idea I would just quickly add um, is that one thing can help is to find a supportive colleague. Um, so this this doesn't have to be, you know, a manager or someone who's sort of above you in the hierarchy, but someone who's at your same level, maybe who you have lunch with or who you sometimes have coffee with and share your idea with them. Practice talking about it. You don't have to sort of talk about your idea for the first time when you're in a big meeting and you feel like there's a lot riding on it. Have that conversation first with your colleague. I mean, for, for example, if I had an idea about how to do something differently on my team, I might chat with Daisy about it first and see what she thinks and test out the idea, improve it. Again, share that knowledge with her. And then I think you get that boost of confidence to take it to your team because you know that you've already spoken with somebody else about it, someone who supports you and someone who's going to have your back if other people don't agree. That's OK, too. If people don't want to adopt your idea, it's not personal. It's not that they don't like you. It's just that maybe they don't want to adopt that idea at that particular time. So I think also don't give up. Keep trying. Keep bringing new ideas. Just because one innovation got shot down doesn't mean that you don't have good ideas and good innovations. It just means that particular one didn't work. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the whole point of innovation, just continuing to iterate. So I believe we had a very fruitful discussion this afternoon. So uh, unfortunately, that's the only time that we have for this session. I would like to thank all of the participants who actively participated in the chat box. So on behalf of the Academy, I would like to thank Daisy and Helen for sharing. And we hope that you learned a lot from this session. So again, my name is Gerard Calambro. Yeah, well, I'd just like to say thank you for joining. I know it's the end of your working day now, so lots of you probably want to go home um, and enjoy your evening. It's been a great start of the day for us. Um, it's been, like I said, really fun, and we appreciate you kind of getting involved. Um, and it's been really interesting to hear your thoughts as well on the topic. So thanks again, everyone, for joining. And thank you um, to the Centre for the invitation to speak as well. Um, I just want to echo Daisy and say thank you. I mean, it's a real privilege to get to be a part of a conversation like this that that really is knowledge sharing. I think it's sort of fun to be able to talk about knowledge sharing while we're actually engaging in it. So thank you for teaching us. Uh, thank you for engaging with us and for sharing your thoughts as well. All right. So again, my name is Gerard Calambro. My name is Michael Sarabia. My name is David. And, and I'm Helen. <laughs> so again, thank you. And we hope to see you again on our next public sector productivity webinar. Thank you.